most of our people back uh, that are no doubt wanting to be here and just cannot. We had a good meeting with the men just a few minutes ago, and just one of the things we talked about, I uh, just wanted everyone to know, we're going to try to keep everybody up to date as much as possible, is that we're going to uh, try to uh, begin a, a school of evangelism that uh, is in many congregations. Uh, it requires all of us participating, and we'll uh, update you more on that. But I just would like to ask for you to pray for it, that it will be successful, and that we'll be able to, to go forward with it. And wouldn't it be wonderful if, if next year, this time, we could double the size of our congregation? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Uh, that's not impossible. It sounds impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And uh, the School of Evangelism workshop that we uh, participated in, several of the men here at Madison County, uh, they're having success uh, to a degree already with uh, visitors and, and Bible studies uh, that they didn't have two months ago or even just a few weeks ago. And so we're, we're hoping to be able to, uh, to do that. I just want to mention this. It's not something I normally would mention from the pulpit, but I did want to say this because uh, it's the best opportunity that I have. Uh, we had someone visit Wednesday night, and so after services, if you just mention to me that you can send a card uh, to this young lady uh, that you know, and we're going to try to already begin some things, whether we officially begin the school of evangelism or not, but one of the things we need to do is shower people with love, with cards, and different things like that, and so uh, if we can get, you know, five people, say, to send a card this week to, to this young lady. Uh, she's, she's looking for someone somewhere to, to participate in a, in a congregation and, and, and shown up a couple of times on her own. And so I just really think that that would be a, a wonderful uh, use of, uh, of, of our time. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life when the clouds unfold their wings of strife? When the strong tides lift and the cables strain, will your anchor hold Drift or firm remain. When our eyes behold through the gathering night, the city of gold, our harbor bright, we shall anchor last by the heavenly shore with the storms all past forevermore. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll, fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep, in the Savior's love. I don't know if we ever sing that here in this congregation. It's a beautiful song. And we do have an anchor, do we not? Our anchor is Jesus Christ. And so tonight, we're going to look in the book of Hebrews. If you want to open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 6. This is the next lesson in our series of, of classes or lessons on the book of Hebrews. And the title that I gave to this lesson is, We Have an Anchor of the Soul. And it actually comes at the very uh, end of uh, this particular uh, group of verses. It comes from verse 19. It says, This hope we have as an anchor of a soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. And so we're going to talk more about this anchor of the soul tonight. We've been in the book of Hebrews and the first few chapters told us uh, through the inspired writer, whoever that was, that uh, Jesus is better. The Hebrew Christians needed to know that. We may not need to know that. We may not already understand. We're not wanting to go back to the Hebrew traditions and customs and cultures and laws. But there are people in the church that do want to go back. And they do regress. And they uh, go back into the former way of life. And so for us, that would be probably uh, the equivalent here. And so Jesus is better than what? He's better than the old law. He's better than all those ritualistic uh, sacrifices and, and, and ways of life of, of the Hebrew people for thousands of years. He's better. The covenant in the New Testament is better. He's better than Moses. Now for, the, for us, that doesn't seem like a big deal in some way because of course we recognize that, but for the Hebrew people, Abraham and Moses were it. In fact, they 
uh, don't even many of them recognize that Jesus is the, the Messiah that was prophesied for thousands of years. And so in chapter 3, uh, Jesus is better than Moses. And the author continues to, to hit on that nail uh, that he is better. And so tonight, beginning with verse 9 of chapter 6, we began, we ended last week with this verse, Beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. The manner in which the author was speaking was a little rough, a little tough. He had called them babes. He said that they were spiritually immature. He had said that they were in need of the first principles, the oracles of God. He said that they were unskilled in the word of righteousness. And so, therefore, you are babes. Uh, and so, when verse 9 of chapter 6 says, though we speak in this manner, I believe he's talking about that in the manner that I just mentioned, but we're confident of better things concerning you. And so the author was wise enough not only to call their attention to the fact that they were failing, that they were needing to grow, that they were needing to get beyond being spiritual babes in Christ, even though they've been in the church for many, many years, he was also saying that you need to, uh, that, that we are confident in you, that you are going to, to grow, even though you need this harsh, uh, difficult uh, talk and admonishing. But in verse 10, the Bible says, For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, uh, which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. Aren't you glad that God is just? That God is not unjust? We have so much injustice in our world, in our country, in our judicial system that is supposed to level out, you know, the law. But it doesn't in times. And so it says God is not unjust. And how is he not unjust? He's not unjust just uh, to forget your works. Isn't it wonderful? Sometimes we feel like, and as we begin evangelizing and teaching about evangelizing, and sometimes it's little bitty tiny steps, just sitting a card, or just making a small phone call, or just talking to someone for, for five minutes after worship services. Those little works of love, sometimes we think no one notices that. No one really recognizes that. I'm not being recognized for what I do. There are many that do things in the church and they don't do it for recognition, but it doesn't hurt to get a little bit of thank you, you know, right? Thank you. Thank you for doing this or thank you for doing that. Uh, as a minister, I know when someone says that was a good lesson, it's like, oh, well, that one that worked out for me, you know? Not because it's about us, but we just want to know that people appreciate what you're doing. And so the Bible says here that God is not unjust just to forget your work uh, and also your, your labor of love. And so the work that we do for Christ is a labor of love. It's a, a work out of caring and loving others. And so many times we're not going to get the recognition. We're not going to get the, the thanks. I've wondered sometimes as someone preached, you know, one time that, you know, you're not supposed to appreciate, you know, ministers and elders and teachers or preachers. Or, and I don't think so, but, but we really need to do that more. When there's young men, whether it's Blake or Robert or different ones and different uh, uh, ones that are teaching Bible classes, thank you for doing that. They're taking precious time and energy to do that that they can devote to their children or to other things. And so the point is here is that God is not unjust. He remembers. He remembers your works. He remembers the things that you do. And he remembers your labor uh, of love. And then it says here, what did they do that God remembered? It said here, you have ministered to the saints. To the saints. Is there a difference between those that are saints and those that are not? The Bible says there is. There are. There are those that we can identify. We may not know all of them because God knows who they're his, right? Knows the intents of the heart. But there is a group of people that are the saints. There's a group of people that are the church. Those are those that have been added to the church by God. And it says here that God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love that you've shown toward his name and that you have ministered to the saints. In the past, you have ministered 
to the saints. And so whether it's a card or a, a gift or a, a call or a visit or in some way you've ministered to the saints, it may not seem like a big thing. It may just be a pot of soup, a tiny pot of soup that you give to somebody. Those are works uh, that in this particular case were given to the saints and it says and do minister as well. In other words, you continue to minister. And so God is not excuse me, unjust to forget your work. And it's important to remember. Because you know what we get discouraged, don't we? We kind of get down. It's like, you know what, I've been doing this for a long time. I wish I could get out of doing this particular thing, whether it's teaching a Bible class or, you know, I've evangelized for a long time or did mission work. And sometimes we kind of get tired. But God remembers. God is not unjust to forget. And then verse 11. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. Show the same diligence of the hope. Well, what is the hope? The hope is Christ. The hope is looking at Christ and looking at the, the final outcome that as Christ died and was buried and resurrected, we also, one day, we're going to pass through this life and we're probably going to be buried. And we're going to be resurrected. And that is the hope that we have. That is a hope the world does not have. If you were to go out of here and ask 10 out of 10 people, just general people, if you have very much hope for tomorrow, hope for the government, or hope for your family, or hope for the future, or hope of heaven, I would probably say, many of them would say, not, not really. Don't have a whole lot of hope that our, that our, our nation, our government is going to be good. They might actually think they're going to heaven. I don't know, but... In general, people don't have hope for tomorrow. And this says that we desire that each one of you, the Hebrew brothers and sisters, show the same diligence to the full assurance of the hope until the end. It reminds me of Revelation chapter 2 and, and verse 10. Does it not be faithful unto death? And then I will give you the crown of life. And the, the uh, Christians in the Roman Empire were undergoing severe persecutions. And then verse 12, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. I think it's interesting here because in chapter 5, verse 11, you remember that the writer said that they were becoming dull of hearing. Now he's saying, we're hoping that you do not become sluggish. When the Bible talks about being sluggish and dull of hearing, it's talking to a people that are not listening. They're not absorbing. They're not applying. And when it talks about sluggishness, that is uh, an idea of you are allowing sin in your life to make you mentally sluggish. Many times as we begin to get involved in sin and repetitive sin and, and we are in that cycle, we can't break the cycle, whatever the, the particular type of sin is, sometimes we become sluggish, we begin to to justify ourselves. If somebody hadn't brought that magazine into my house and made me see that, I wouldn't have seen it. If somebody had not brought over food that I would have not have overeaten, or whatever the case may be. We, we, we make excuses for why that we have done wrong, or why we have sinned. And in the Bible it says that you, the writer hopes that because of the hope that you do not become sluggish. But it also says that you are to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Imitate those. Uh, it says imitate other Christians who are number one, patient, number two, faithful, and number three, inherit the promises. Now who in the Bible do you know that was patient and faithful and inherited the promises? Well, we're talking about the Old Testament here, not the New Testament. You Think of someone in the New Testament. But this is referring to those of the Old Testament. Because the New Testament had not, had not been written yet at this time. And so if you look back uh, in verse 13, Hebrews 6, 13, it tells you who he's talking about. He's talking about Abraham. Abraham, the father of faith, the one that all uh, Jewish people look up to, Abraham. And it says, for when God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely 
Blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater in an oath for confirmation is for them uh, an end of all dispute. And so here he's talking about Abraham. He is one that the Hebrew brothers and sisters and we should imitate. He was faithful, he was patient, and he obtained the promises. And it says here that God confirmed uh, by, in the New King James, it says swearing. In other words, taking an oath, the idea of promising, I promise, and God says, I promise uh, that this will happen. Surely blessing, I will bless you, he said to Abraham, God did, and multiplying, I will multiply you. And so God said, my promises are real. I'm not lying. They're unchangeable. My counsel is true. And, and, and for whatever reason God wanted to, he made a, an oath, the Bible says swore, which is to promise uh, that he would do that. And by knowing this, it's impossible, we know the Bible says for God to lie. If you uh, look at verse 19, verse 19, uh, look at verse 18. Verse 17, thus God determined to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, the unchangeability of his counsel, of God's counsel, confirmed it by an oath. We just mentioned that, verse 18, that by two immutable things, two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. And so therefore this hope we have is an anchor of the soul. Uh, we have an anchor of the soul both sure and steadfast. When you look at the Old Testament, uh, Jesus uh, had uh, entered in the New Testament behind the veil and the high priest. But if you look into the Old Testament and you have to turn over to Exodus uh, chapter 26 and actually have time to, to read chapter 26, when it talks about the making of the tabernacle and how it was that it was uh, to be constructed. And then if you get to verse 20 through uh, 33, uh, God instructed Moses and the ones that worked on it, you shall hang the veil from the clasps. Then you shall bring the ark of the testimony, it's talking about it in the tabernacle, in there behind the veil. The veil shall be a divider for you between the holy place uh, and the most holy place. Now turn over to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19. In verse 19 says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter, what is the place? The holiest by the blood of Jesus. By a new living way which he consecrated for us through the what? Through the veil that is his flesh. And having a poop high priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And so the Holy of Holies was a place in the tabernacle and then later in the temple till it was destroyed in around 870 where the presence of God was. Now that's a capital P, P-R-E-S-C-N-C-E, -E, capital P, presence of God. That's important. It's important because, especially in our world today, everybody talks about gods or God. We have Bibles everywhere, missionaries everywhere, it seems like. But in the Old Testament, that idea of the presence of God, that man, mortal man, sinful man, frail man could be in the presence of the presence which is God. And that's pretty profound. And so when God told Moses to build the tabernacle, there was the holy place. 
And then there was the most holy or the holiest of holies. And the holiest of holies was a dark place. Was it lighted? Would I understand? And it was closed off for a whole year and only one day uh, a year on the day of atonement, the high priest, there was only one high priest could enter into that veil and first he had to make certain sacrifices for himself so that he would be pure enough to enter into the holiest of holies. And in that tabernacle is where God was. That's where God was. We say God's everywhere, but God wanted the people to know he was there. And then you were to come to that place to make atonement for sins regularly, and then especially on that special day of atonement. That's the idea the Hebrew people understood very well and do probably even today what a tabernacle, what a temple was, the holy place, the holy of holies, and what was there, the Ten Commandments and the showbread and the other items, Aaron's rod, and what was there and, and what it meant to be in the presence of God so much that the Hebrew people would not even mention the name of God because he was so holy. They would use Yahweh or some other word to depict or describe who God was. And even in the first century, those that would take the scrolls, the papyra, and unfold them in the, in the, in the synagogues, there was a, a, a certain amount of, of ritual and care for holding and touching, one, because they were fragile, but also because this was, this was God's speaking to us. This was God's word. I sure wish we had that kind of reverence today, don't you? I realize that the Bible is just a book in paper, cardboard maybe, rubber, whatever, a few pictures. But the words contained in it are the presence of God. Jesus is the living word. He is the word, John tells us, but he's the living word. And if we can just, with our own lives, live the holiness of the presence of God in our lives, then I believe it would be a lot easier to make it to heaven. And to please him with everything. And if we can somehow teach our families and our children about the holiness of God, take time to be holy, take time at home to have devotionals and, and stop and pray before your meals and it may not be convenient, but do it anyway. So that our children will understand that God is holy. And the tabernacle and the temple was built in part for that reason so that the people, the Hebrew people would come there and that's where they would make atonement for their sins. The Bible calls it here in Hebrews the presence, capital P, R E S C E N C E, the presence. That means God was there. God was there. I don't know if that makes sh shivers up your spine, but it does mine. To think that we can come together as God's people and God is present. He didn't have to be, but He chose to. And he chose us through obedience to the scriptures to be, to be his people. And then he says here in this passage in chapter 10, we jump from chapter 6 to chapter uh, 7 to 10, therefore having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, no Jew in their right mind would ever dare enter into the holiest of holies. Are you kidding only the high priest can do that. One time a year only, after he's purified himself with sacrifices on the altar. And now God is saying to the Hebrew brothers and to us thousands of years later, you can have boldness to enter into the holiest of holies. But not because you're great. Not because you deserve it but because of the blood of Jesus. 
And that blood of Jesus you contact through baptism. Romans chapter 6 teaches us that. And so if you want to be able to have the boldness that the Bible teaches us, that we're not to come weakly and meekly or with weakness, but we are to have boldness and enemy the holiest. And it says, by, uh, by the blood of Jesus, by a new living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. You know what happened when Christ died? The veil was what? Look at that. The veil was rent. It was torn asunder. Because the one that now is the Holy of Holies and the High Priest is Jesus. And it even says, and having a high priest over the house of God. We are the house of God. This building is not. We are the house. And so let us draw near with a true heart. Here it is. Not with weakness and not with weakness, but with boldness. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. The reason that we pray is because we have faith, but not just weak and meek faith. We have a strong faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies, there is baptism washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hate, hope without wavering. In other words, don't go back, don't look back, don't look back at Abraham and, and Moses and, and what it was and where we could go back. That's kind of like the Israelites in the desert where God was there in their presence. by a cloud, a pillar, and fire for years and years and gives them food. And because they're a little thirsty, maybe a lot, I don't know, they want to go back to Pharaoh and to Egypt and, and complain and murmur. Murmur against Moses. The Bible says actually against God because God chose Moses to be the leader. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, without thinking. Let's go back. Angels are better. <laughs> For he who promised is faithful. God dwelt among the people. You can look back in Leviticus, uh, Leviticus chapter 16, and you will find how uh, God dwelt among the people. And the mercy seat was there. And as you look at, I believe it's the end of Exodus, I didn't write down the scripture here. But there was a cloud at the very end of the construction of the tabernacle and the Holy of Holies. And the Bible says there's a cloud that covered the tabernacle of meeting. And the glory of the Lord is in Exodus 40, 34 through 38, 38. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now, I don't know what that means, but the glory of God, the Lord, filled the tabernacle as it was finished. And if you look at verses 34 through 38, it's really, really impressive. It says that God's presence was in Israel. Listen to this. Exodus chapter 40, verse 34. This is after the tabernacle was completed. The cloud covered the tabernacle, verse 34, of me. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. When the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in their journeys, that 40-year journey in the wilderness. But listen to this. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not journey to the day that it was taken up. In other words, the cloud showed them where to go, where to stop. Listen to this, verse 38. For the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day, 
and fire was over it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. Why? Because God's capital P presence was with them. And so when you go back to Hebrews, the Bible says in verse 19, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which, here it is, and which enters the presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, -E -E, presence as God behind the veil. Where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Jesus has gone before. He is the forerunner. He is now the high priest. How is it that you come to God? You do not need a priest. And you don't need a tabernacle. And you don't need the holy of holies or the holy place. What you need is God in Christ. And Christ is the mediator between God. And when you pray, you don't pray to Christ. You pray to God through Christ. Christ is the one that intervenes and mediates for us. And without Christ, you have no right to enter into the Holy of Holies, which is the presence of God. And so be careful. Be careful. When you begin praying, that you are praying in a right way, that you are praying through Christ, who is your high priest. Because the Bible says, as your high priest, he mediates, he intervenes. He is, as it were, your lawyer helping your case before God. And he's been tempted in all the ways that we have. And he's the one that is saying, I was there. I know what it's like to be tempted. God knows that we're frail and that we're weak and sinful. But he says we can have boldness because of love. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the devil is low. Thank you, good God. Amen. Thank you, good God. Really, it's amazing. Night can be come. Wayne, Jesus, come.